Hello, Minnesota, and welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez. It's a beautiful summer day here in the Twin Cities. I thank you all for tuning in. Reminder that we broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock here in SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. And we also get aired live on SPNN in St. Paul. And our YouTube channel is youtube.com, Tony Hernandez Show. Go there, subscribe, share the video with your friends on Twitter, on Facebook. We certainly appreciate you tuning in. We have a great show today. We have constitutional party endorsed candidate, Tim Oots. He's running for the Minnesota State House. Uh, this is his fourth time running, and we're going to be talking about his campaign. We're going to be getting into the issues. I'm really excited to have Tim on because he is a true student of public policy and also what is happening at the Minnesota State Capitol. A lot of times we have uh, candidates uh, that go out there and run, and they don't necessarily know the numbers and the figures about the budget about the taxes, about the spending. Uh, so we're going to really dive in deep and talk to Tim about these important issues. And with that, I'm going to bring on Tim Oots to the show. Tim, thank you for uh, joining. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Yeah, I was saying this is actually, we're, we're standing in the exact room where you and I first met in 2010, Sue Jeffers. Sue uh, Jeffers and I had a co-host of the show, and, we, and I had a great time with her for about uh, 30 shows we did. And then it kind of expanded from there, and you got involved, and a bunch of other candidates in 2010 got involved. Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt that you have uh, inspired a lot of people to get involved, not only with your campaign, but you've inspired other people to run for office. Um, you know, you're running with a, a non-traditional party, the Constitutional Party. Right. Um, and so you first started. You, you first started running in 2008, then you ran as a Republican endorsed candidate back then, is that right? Correct, yep. in 2010, yep. Oh, 2008, the in first time I And then in 2010, did I you I ran again. As a Republican? As a Republican. And then uh, you made the change to the Constitutional Party, and can you just tell everybody uh, why a little you made bit that about change? It. Yeah. I was part of the 2010 GOP plan, to, and our the overall statewide policy was to say we're going to spend $28 billion and no more in a general fund. That was kind of the campaign slogan. It was a great idea, but when, once the Republicans got control of the House and the Senate, that they went right ahead and spent, I think, $34.5 billion. They gave the governor a budget of $34.5 billion. I couldn't continue to carry the water bucket anymore as, as, as far as that goes for a candidate, so I made the choice to go ahead and switch parties. Is in my district, it's very uh, it's a very unique district demographically. Mm -hmm. so. so this district that you're running in, then it's in uh, it's 41B. Is that right? Currently it's 41B. Back then it was 50A. Okay. Redistricting 2010 changed that over to 41B. So it, we it encompasses all of Hilltop, all of Columbia Heights, okay. all of St. Anthony, and the southern half of New Brighton, basically south of Seventh Street, south of 694. Mm -hmm. And would you consider it uh, like a center right district, or is it uh, more liberal, or what? What's the the makeup the of the constituency? The make, uh, parts of it are are more on the Republican side. Parts of it, a lot of it's more on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. Jesse Ventura won in t t 1998 when he ran for governor. I believe so. He won that district 38 and a half percent, 38.6 percent. Mm -hmm. So there's a draw from both sides. He took an awful lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans away from the the uh, parties and won that district. Mm -hmm. It's very obvious from the demographics that we've seen over the years that I'm doing the same thing. It's happening, especially this year. So a lot of unhappy Democrats and unhappy Republicans who are stepping off to the side and voting and planning and tend to vote for me. I have a lot of Democrats this year that are saying, stick a yard sign in my yard who would never talk to me five years ago. Hmm. Can you tell uh, tell us what what is the Constitutional Party? How long has the Constitutional Party been present here in Minnesota, and what are the basic principles that uh, the party adheres to? The Constitutional Party was a combination of several different parties back about 20, 25 years ago. It's the third largest party in the country. A lot of people think the Libertarian Party or the Independence Party mm -hmm. is the largest, but the Constitutional Party is actually the largest party in the country. It's not so well known up here. South and Southwest, Southeast, it's a lot more popular, a lot more people down there. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we have a membership, I believe, nationally of about 700,000 people compared to 42 million Democrats and 42 million Republicans. But then that's the disparity that we have with our political process. Mm -hmm. So the Constitution Party actually supports candidates who actually believe in the Constitution, actually practice it in principle. We get a lot, we have a f elections that at the local level are nonpartisan that we have a better shot at mm -hmm. winning. This, uh, for me in 2012,
2012, I got 13.5% in a three-way race. And at that time in 2012, I think there was 23 or 24 contested three-way races in the state. The next highest third-party candidate was 8%, and then went down to 2% after that. I was the highest by far of any third-party candidate in the state for 20, in 2012. We've had a, a number of third-party and in the true independent candidates. We had uh, last week a, a woman, her name is Yolandita Colon. Uh, she is running in uh, Minneapolis district as a true independent. We had uh, Lena Bugs on the show earlier. She's running uh, under the, the banner of the Green Party. And uh, out of the, the various parties, where does the constitutional uh, party align? Are there any similarities between the Constitutional Party and, say, the Republican Party or the Green Party or the Independence Party? Uh, is there a flexibility allowed? There is flexibility. I just, as an example, I was, Monday I was endorsed by the Libertarian Party of Minnesota. Socially, we, socially we don't agree on a whole lot. Uh, finan monetarily, we agree on a lot of things. The areas of war and gov big government, what we have a lot of agreement on. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of where the we're a lot similar to different. In the Republican Party, again, there's a lot to be. There's a difference between saying I'm a Republican as a as an elected official and acting like the party, like the platform is, and or what a lot of them do. They'll say that to get elected, and then when they're elected, they got a different road that they that they hold. Mm -hmm. Toe or hole, what's the right word I want to use, but anyway. Toe sounds toe good. Toe sounds good, yeah. <laughs> so. Hmm. so, and then one of the uh, the disadvantages maybe of, of running on a, a third party is that, you know, if you get endorsed by the, a major party, Republican or Democrat, you automatically go on the ballot if there's a primary challenge, and then you're automatically on the ballot in the general election, whereas with the Constitutional Party, uh, you uh, actually have to go out there and work to get on the ballot. And Dallas, if we can uh, pull up this picture here, you recently accomplished a, a major feat, and can you tell everybody what uh, what this picture is showing? Well, what this is, is we just had an election, uh, not election, this is dealing with uh, Columbia Heights wants to build a library. Mm -hmm. and so in our charter, because we're a charter city, we have the right as citizens to repeal that decision by the city council. Mm -hmm. We had about a week and a half, and we got out, got almost 1,300 signatures. We only needed 1,000, but we still got 1,300 in wow. about a week and a half. So you mobilized these people? Well, I tried to stay out of it mm -hmm. as much as possible, but I found myself deep in it because most of those people you see in that picture are actually supporters of my campaign. Mm -hmm. So I, they all left me standing around my house, and I'm going, well, I guess I got no place to go. I might as well go help them for about a week and a half. And what was the issue with the with the library then? The city council voted to build a $9 million library and bond $7 million, take $2 million out of the general fund. And they want to start right now. This process that we just, uh, right now the names are being certified. All this vote, the registered voters we got signatures are being certified by the city. Once mm -hmm. that happens, the question will be on the ballot in November, do you want to build a library? And the people in the city will decide instead of four people in the city council deciding if they want to spend that money. We had a lot of people sign the petition and say, I want a library. I'm supporting a new library. I also understand your point. There should be a choice by the people. So I, I suspect it's going to pass, and probably overwhelmingly. But we wanted people to have a choice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't fair to the or right actually for the city to uh, arbitrarily do this on such a big issue. That's a secondary function of government. If they're going to buy a fire truck, a new vacuum hose for the sewer system, or whatever. That's that's part of their function. But when they start spending ten million dollars on a facility that's not the primary function of get city government, then we wanted to step in and give the people a chance to vote. Hmm. So but back to your other question you mentioned about running for office and filing. Mm -hmm. There was a two-week period in, from the middle of May to the 1st of June where third-party candidates have to physically go out and get signatures. Now it's directly against the state constitution. It's a violation of our constitution. There's only three requirements for me as a candidate is to be uh, living in, a Minnesota citizen, living in a state for, in the district for six months, and then be a registered voter. That's the only requirements. But the the legislature over the years, especially the last 30 years, has added a bunch of requirements to keep third-party candidates off the ballot. Hmm. I'm fortunate. I have a strong support base. I have a strong campaign group of about 20 volunteers. We can go out and get the signatures without any trouble. And I just filed this year. I think I was supposed to get 500 signatures. And I got filed 672 mm -hmm. signatures and was put on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So, do you uh, do you agree with uh, what they're doing in, in Minneapolis with the uh, instant runoff voting no. and the number of candidates that ran for? Well, the I like the number of candidates. Yeah, so that was great. You think more people need to be on the ballot? On the ballot, the more the merrier. Actually, 
If you do the math, if I run against one other individual, I have to get 50% plus one. If there's three people on a ballot, Jesse Ventura is an example in our district, one at 38.5%. It's mm -hmm. easier to win if you got more people on a ballot. Mm -hmm. Plus, it gives people choice. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think people need to really get more involved in government. We have a civil and res we have a constitutional responsibility to be participating in government. We don't do that. We make sure our kids go golfing, they got soccer, or whatever we do. Government, getting involved in politics, nah, 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 nah. So. Yeah, you know, I've talked to in this on this show a lot about uh, the history of Minnesota politics and the way that things used to be done. If you, if you look at uh, ballots. Uh, like pre-1960, so before the 1960s, there wasn't a party listed next no, to no. a person's name. I think maybe they would uh, sometimes put in liberal or conservative next to them, uh, but it wasn't until after the 1960s that on the ballot we started to actually see, and this is for uh, Minnesota state House constitutional races, ra races uh, you know, where you see the R for Republican or, or DFL mm -hmm. for, for Democrat. And, you know, a lot of people say that it, it may be, we may be better off by, you know, allowing people to run under a party endorsement if they want to. But at the end of the day, on the general election, just to have the names the out names, there. What, right. do you, uh, what are your feelings about that? I know as running twice as a third party candidate, the process is hard if you don't have a support base. I have a support base, so it's easy for me. The other guy down the street in the next district, out in the south, out state Minnesota, is going to really have a hard time just getting on the ballot because you have to physically go get 500 signatures. And mm -hmm. if, you're, if your neighbors aren't keen because you're outside of a major party structure, they think you're going to dilute the vote, whatever else, they might not sign your petition. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And I that part I disagree with because in a free republic that we have, you should be involved in the politics. And if there's 20, like I love Minneapolis, they had 34 candidates on the ballot for mayor, and I think the one the gal who won had like 26% or 20% or whatever mm -hmm. it was. But it was a lot of fun watching 35 people get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. We have Columbia Heights right now. We're having the primaries is coming up. We have nine, eight or nine people on running for city council for two spots. So we're going to primary. We're going to go through that process. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun seeing a lot, a lot of people getting involved in the process. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, the other thing that we talk about on this show with the history of Minnesota politics and the way things have been done here is uh, I did a whole show on uh, the, the Minnesota political debate, and we pulled out archives and research of debates that happened in the past, uh, Norm Coleman versus Paul Wellstone, Rod Grams. Uh, we had all these Minnesota uh, former uh, politicians in, in some of their debates. And at least in my opinion, it seems that the debates that took place uh, prior to you know the early 2000s were much more rigorous. They were much more, um, you know, they'd go deeper into the issues and they were more public. And now, uh, Dallas, if we can pull up this, this article here, I actually just uh, uh, heard about this. This was NPR report, Tom Scheck, July 25th, 2014. Uh, but it says, Governor Dayton has formally declined uh, the NPR state fair debate invitation. So Governor Dayton's campaign has said that they are not going to debate in the state fair debate, which is a, a great debate. I mean, you can't get much more... Uh, uh, you know, a better place for a great debate and to start the campaign mm -hmm. season off than the State Fair. It says that Dayton declined an invitation. It said Dayton's campaign manager, Catherine Tanucci, did not give a specific reason, but she said that there's just basically too many debates and uh, that there's too many debates for the voters and that they don't uh, need to do this. And they said that they'll do a certain amount of debates uh, after Labor Day. Um, probably that are going to be in locations and uh, orchestrated by things that are in their favor and that they have more control of. But um, I wanted to get your opinion, Tim, on this. It, it, you know, A, do you think that Governor Dayton should be debating in the NPR state fair debate? And then B, do we have enough public discussion and debate about the issues and about what's going on uh, locally at our capital here in Minnesota? As far as debates, I believe that every candidate who's legally on the ballot should be like the governor's race. I believe there's nine candidates running for governor. It, it makes for a crowded stage. I still think that's what we should have. People should be fully informed and that person should be able to be out there. As a candidate, I can't understand not taking every opportunity you can to talk to the public. I don't care if it's a Democrat or Republican to me. 
if you got a forum, if you got a message, like I have a message, you want as many people as possible to hear that message because they're going to talk to their neighbors, friends. They're going, oh, yeah, I know so and so lives in Saint New Brighton or St. Anthony, and I have a lot of that going on now. Whereas I meet somebody in Stillwater. Well, I can't vote for you. And I say, well, do you know somebody in Columbia Heights? Well, yeah, Joe. Well, then go tell Joe to vote for me. So it's for, for somebody to turn down a debate, just, I don't understand that. I just don't. And again, this isn't about party affiliation. Mm -hmm. This is just why wouldn't you get the airtime? It's mm -hmm. free. You try buying airtime. I'll tell you what, you get real quick on learning how to figure out how to get it for free. So, mm -hmm. you know, the other the other uh, complaint that that's out there right now is um, the legislature has, and, and maybe you know more about this, but they've somehow have kicked the can down the road for Mincher and the Mincher premiums that are going to be coming in the following year. And they've conveniently uh, kicked the can down far enough where we're not going to hear about these new premiums coming out until after, after election, the right. election. And uh, what is your feeling on Minsher? Now, I know that the Republican candidate for governor, Scott Honor, has said that we need to just scrap Minsher and be absorbed into the federal exchange. Um, other people have said we need to improve Minsher and, and dump more money into this website to try to get it, it to the standards of, of other uh, websites that are out there. Um, if you're elected and you're a state house representative, what sort of initiatives are you going to promote to deal with Minsure? I actually lost my health insurance this year because of Minsure. I had a plan that expired because of the Obamacare and all this stuff went on. When I went around, and then I was going to go out and buy some health insurance. And then I found out that I waited too long to buy it because there was some arbitrary drop dead date. So now I know better than I did last year. I'm an informed citizen. I'm an informed consumer of healthcare. The for me, this whole thing is a big mess as far as health insurance. We've gone so far down the road in socialism and and, and assuming the government's got the best interest in all of us, that we can't even relate anymore to what freedom is and what our personal responsibility is. I advocate for getting rid of Minsure. I don't advocate for replacing it with Obamacare. It's still government-run health health care. That's basically where I'm coming from. Do I have all the answers and solutions today? No, I don't, and I won't have them in the capital either. But I do know the principle of we need to be taking care of ourselves. If I'm taken care of by government aid through Minsure or Obamacare, it's coming out of your pocket or our neighbor's pocket or some poor guy down in Alabama is paying for it and vice versa. So that's that's where I stand on that. I would advocate for removing us off of that. It's a mess. I, I talked to my health insurance company provider at the time about a year ago, a year and a half ago. He goes, oh, you wait till January 2014, your premiums are going to skyrocket. I was, my personal insurance premium would have gone up if I could have been able to keep it, but I wasn't able to. It would have gone up 368% on January 1st this year. I don't know what it's going to be next year, but I've been told it's going to be another 100% increase from this year mm -hmm. if I can afford to buy it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's mm -hmm. not been a pretty experience for me. One of the, uh, one of the solutions that uh, conservatives have offered for Minsure is to increase competitiveness, um, to allow people to purchase health care across state lines. That's, that's one solution that's offered. Another one is to uh, better inform patients towards what the cost of their health care is actually going to be and, and how that affects their bottom line so that they can shop around and look for, you know, maybe this hospital costs this much to have a baby in and this hospital does it this way and costs this much. Do you, do you have any ideas as to how to focus in and uh, lower the cost of health care, which is basically the consensus with with what needs to be done is we need more affordable health care. Obviously, Obamacare is not the answer. Uh, but what, what ideas do you have to lower the cost of health care for families? Well, I'll give you a personal example of myself. I'm generally healthy. I, I, might, I still got two arms, two legs. I discovered I could buy catastrophic health care for $103 a month at my age with a non-smoker from my health care provider that would cover if my heart stopped or whatever. Mm -hmm. That doesn't qualify for Obamacare. In Obamacare, there's auxiliary health care providing policies. There's a whole gamut of federally required health insurance. Now, the purpose of Obamacare was to eliminate the catastrophic 
people going into the hospital with catastrophic health issues and wiping out the hospital or wiping out the government or the private insurance. I could buy that for $103 a month. The other option is to buy qualified Obamacare for $400 a month. So what's the point of Obamacare? I can buy health insurance that meets my need. Mm -hmm. The government won't let me. Mm -hmm. So, so, that, so that's where we got this problem. We got these mandates, and one of the problems people don't understand about our government is when they make a decision, it's by force, and there is no common reason sense. It's a law, and it's enforced. Where if you and I are having a conversation, and I'm looking at you as my insurance agency, I don't need birth control because mm -hmm. I'm 56 years, 57 years old, and I'm not going to worry about having kids. Mm -hmm. The government says you're a, you're an insurance uh, consumer. You have to have birth control. Mm -hmm. So you got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So there's a ways you could reduce it. But again, the option we're being taught about is just a different version of the same thing. Government mm -hmm. mandated controls over health care. Mm -hmm. You know, and speaking of uh, the issue of uh, birth control, contraceptives, abortifacients, the recent Supreme Court decision, the Hobby Lobby decision that came out uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, basically uh, sided with Hobby Lobby saying that uh, because of the um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that companies and corporations and people do have a choice and they can they cannot be mandated to provide something that violates a, a deeply held religious belief. Um, they also said that this is not the same as forcing an individual to pay a tax, right? It's a, mm -hmm. There's it a collective people, state yeah, interest that yeah. says that we have to pay uh, taxes and, and we're going to have a show in the future about the Hobby Lobby decision but it, in my viewpoint it, it, this this decision is inconsistent because uh, the prior ruling uh, last summer in regards to Obamacare uh, Justice Roberts stated that Obamacare is essentially a tax which is why they could enforce the individual mandate to purchase the federal uh, uh, insurance on the exchange but in this decision, they're saying that it's not a tax and that these are, um, you know, some of these provisions and whatnot don't meet that, that sort of equality. And, you know, so in your opinion, do you agree with the Hobby Lobby decision? Do you think that was the right decision made? I want to back up one step and, and talk just a second about the Supreme Court's power. The Supreme Court was set up to be, have an opinion that the legislature and executive branches of the federal government could reconsider decisions that they made. The Supreme Court, the nine people of the Supreme Court, are not the king. We went to, we had a civil war, I mean a revolutionary war over this whole issue of the courts, along with the king dictating his edict from England. The, he placed in, in the judiciary and the state and the colonies people that would do his bidding for him and rulings and, and oppression on the people. The courts, the Supreme Court is set up to be an opinion-based organization to give the, the other branch of government some consideration. We've long lost the purpose and the function. Hmm. I find it humorous myself when conservatives, quote conservatives, bash a decision from the Supreme Court they don't like and say, oh, that's terrible, Supreme Court, what a bad ruling. Then when something like Hobby Law becomes on, they praise the Supreme mm -hmm. Court for making a wise decision. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a decision, it's an opinion. If you mm -hmm. go back and read what the courts will put out, it's their opinion. Mm -hmm. It's not an edict from the courts. Mm -hmm. So but that's kind of, and so in a sense, I would agree with their, their opinion that we have a liberty under a republic form of government to have religious freedom. Yes, I would agree with that. Mm. Does that kind of... I know I got a little sidetracked there, but yeah, the, I just want to touch on that a little bit because we have long lost the the real purpose of the court. Yeah, and that's a that's a fantastic uh, point that that you make because there is the perception out there that what the Supreme Court hails is, is the, end the, of the supreme. World. Is the, the supreme, supreme law. law, and it's not. And in fact, it's just it's one branch's opinion of what's going on, mm -hmm. and it's an opinion. Yeah. That's, uh, I've, I've had that uh, discussion with other constitutional scholars and they've made that same point. I think it's, it's a very, very important point. And you make. need people in public service at the state legislature who know that. Mm -hmm. And who's not afraid of the courts and will take on the courts. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have too much party going on at the legislature to be able to even have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to uh, get into some more of the issues. But uh, before we do, I, I just wanted to talk about uh, your, your famous... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> little uh, bus that you have. You started, 
so you, if, when you first started your campaign, and if we go to your website here, Dallas, if we can pull up his website, timootsforhouse.com. So we, we see the picture of this bus. That bus, that was the original one right So there. this is the original bus. So it's a passenger, a lot of paint, a lot of painting on that bus. And we took uh, the seats out and made some uh, room in there to roll around in and some tables and some storage. And it was very po got very popular. Oh, People I'm didn't sure. know what to do with seeing that thing run. A big, uh, you don't want to drive that into a cul-de-sac. Let me tell you, it's a lot of work to turn it around. <laughs> and uh, what, I assume it gets great gas mileage, too? Oh, yeah. I didn't even ask it. I just put gas in when it started getting low and didn't even ask it. I... <laughs> I don't want to know. So you no longer have this bus. Nope, that was one. That was 2008. Then in 2010, we got a mini bus. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, yeah, a school bus. It was a, what we call a short bus. Mm -hmm. We had that for two, 2010, 2012. And then uh, here we have a picture of you. We're downsizing again. Page, yeah. Downsizing, downsizing economizing. We're, we're, we're setting an example for all the people out there and our constituents to let us let them know that I'm dead serious about cutting spending because I've had to cut it myself. Mm-hmm. So here now, my wife graciously let us paint our van, and if you you'll see another picture of it. But we have completely covered it in orange and green, Here's and one. we got some lettering coming up. It is noticeable. It looks nice. You can see that from a satellite right now. We <laughs> pull it out of the driveway. It's we got lettering coming. We're going to order some lettering. We were looking for a campaign bus, but because of the recycling value of these short buses and actually a lot of school districts are going to those over the big buses now for whatever reason we bought our other bus for 800 bucks and that's costing 2000 or more to buy a, a used two feet in a grave bus that just barely runs we don't have two thousand dollars on our campaign this is costing us 100 bucks for i mean 150 dollars for lettering 100 bucks for paint a little elbow grease we'll be out on the road the next couple of days yeah, and my wife says, you will be getting me a new vehicle this fall. And that's what I was going to yeah, ask, because yeah. when I saw these pictures, I'm like, is this uh, reversible it was, paint? It was her idea. Is some water and it disappears, or is it it's permanent? No, it's yeah. permanent. It's going to, yes, it's, that's why I told my mechanic who <laughs> provides me vehicles, I said, you better start looking for one for the bride, because she's going to be expecting one in November after election day. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we're going to uh, take a small break here, Tim, and yeah. we're going to play one of your campaign videos. And then uh, when we come back, we're going to be t discussing more about uh, these issues in detail. And uh, so, Dallas, if we can pop up uh, this is your campaign video right here. Dallas, for 2014, I'm glad you came to our, join our website today. It's New Year's Eve 2013. I'm going to take you on a trip to St. Paul. I want you to see what we're going to be doing in St. Paul when you get over there and vote me in next this 2014 when you vote me in 2014. Carolyn Lane, your current representative, lives two blocks away and takes this 13 and a half mile trip every day to work. She gets $71 a day of your tax money to go to 13 miles to work. When's the last time you got paid $77 to go 13 miles to work? We'll be talking about a few things on the way over there. I want to share this with you and we're going to take a walk. So I want to come with me now. We're going to get in the car and we're going to head over to St. Paul. We've been warming this baby up because it's 10 below right now. Welcome to Minnesota. If you're visiting from out of state, this is what Minnesota's like on New Year's Eve. I think they said 20 below tonight. See you in a minute inside the car. <laughs> so we're taking off here now from the White House in Columbia Heights. And by the way, I think it's only like five degrees in the car right now, but my uh, cameraman looks a little steadier, so we're making progress. It's recycled today. As you can see, we've got a recycling out today, and we need to do some recycling in St. Paul, including our current representative, Caroline. Colonel Lane needs to be retired and recycled with a good quality constitutional conservative like me. Here we are at the intersection of 37th and Stetson Boulevard where there's actually three counties meeting, Hennepin, Anoka, and Ramsey. Along with those three counties in House District 41B, we have four cities, Hilltop, Columbia Heights, New Brighton, St. Anthony, along with two watershed districts and two congressional districts, Congressional District 4 and Congressional District 5. Quite the menagerie of civil government. Great conversation for our topics when you talk about politics in this district. Here we are eastbound on 37th and we're going through the heart of St. Anthony, Minnesota. We're going to make a quick stop at McDonald's. We have some morning breakfast before we head over to St. Paul and do the business of the day. Here we are coming through the drive through at McDonald's. And I order a number two with a medium Sprite. By the way, folks, instead of taking per diem and charging you for this, I'm paying for this out of my own pocket. Just to let you know that you're saving money by hiring Tim to go to St. Paul and represent you. Hi, 
Yes, I think that number two with the 20 ounce Sprite, please. Five dollars first, by now. Thank you. We finished our McDonald's experience. We're going to get here on 35W and finish our trip over to St. Paul as we follow Metro Mobility, who has to stop at every railroad crossing for safety. A little foggy, too, while we're at it. All right, here we go. Coming up on 36 eastbound. Here we are at 35 East South. Just a couple of miles from the Capitol building in downtown St. Paul. We'll be arriving to work very shortly. Here we are, getting off the freeway at University Avenue, the State Capitol Complex, downtown, downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. We are getting on University Avenue at the Capitol Complex, the Capitol building on your left side, under a majorly needed renovation, renovation project. State Capitol, 14.9 miles, a little more than a 13 and a half, because I had to drive around the complex and past the light rail station over there. But here we are. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for visiting the website today. Be sure to vote for me on November 4th, 2014, and tell your friends in Columbia Heights, St. Anthony Hilltop, and New Brighton to vote for me also. Send me to St. Paul. Remember, I'm saving you at least $12,500 a year at per diem. You guys have a great day, and by the way, it's actually warmed up to five below right now, so have a great New Year's and a happy 2014. So that, uh, that's a great video. A little cold looking. I mean, I was shot and went the it's New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, yes. It was, it was a little 20 chilly. below, I remember that yes. day. And so your, your point of this video, besides introduce you and the, and the campaign, is so are you saying that the a current incumbent that she charges the taxpayers to make that trip every day? Is that how it works? Or? The legislators are allowed 71 or $77 a day during session to go to, to, to work. A lot of them collect. Most of them do collect it. I got to give, there's two Democrats here out of, out of um, Mayo Clinic, Rochester area, mm -hmm. who take no per diem and drive up here on their own, with their mm -hmm. own dime, state mm -hmm. hotels, do that type of thing. But the, our representative drives 13 miles to work, gets 71, so 71 or $77 a day. During it. That's about $12,500 tax-free money that, you, that she collects every so year. So the way the per diem works then, they can they actually just collect $77 a day and they don't right. need to report, oh, five bucks went for no. gas and 10 no. bucks went for lunch. And no, nope. they, they get a flat the rate. They can set it whether they get paid five days a week, seven days a week. They set that up at the when before session starts. They get those dollars. Wow. Yeah. And Carolyn was had some medical issues a couple of years ago. She still collected, even though she didn't even go for a month or six weeks, she still collected $77 a day, mm -hmm. even though she didn't, go to, didn't even go to the Capitol. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And a lot of stuff like this goes on at the Capitol. I blame us, the citizens, the constituents. We're too busy, like I said, making our kids, taking our kids to soccer or whatever else to pay attention to what's going on in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some of those things. Uh, you know, as I said in the introduction, that you... Uh, spend a lot of time at the Capitol during sessions. You sit and you watch and observe uh, the sort of shenanigans <laughs> yes, and do, work right. that's done there. And open carry now. I got my carry permits to open carry over there all the time. And of course, that raises a few eyebrows. Yeah. Well, the, the, it seemed that the some of the gun uh, laws and restriction laws that were tried to pass, it seemed like that they failed. Were, were yes. you there for some of those hearings? I was for a couple of them, not, not too many of them. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was pretty busy at, hope that wasn't me. I was pretty busy doing other things, but yeah, there was a few meetings. And of course those, if you've, if you've ever tried to follow a meeting at the Capitol, they change a lot. It's 9 a.m. Tuesday, then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's 10, 30 a.m. Mm -hmm. Depending on if the chairman of the committee wants somebody to be there or doesn't want somebody to be there, mm -hmm. a lot of this goes on on a regular basis down at the Capitol to avoid mm -hmm. Um, conf confrontation or just they don't want they don't want the public there they want to make sure it's during business hours where everybody's working mm -hmm. well let's uh, let's use some of the knowledge that, that you've gathered I will and, see how I do and, and <laughs> just say so, you know give people more information because we hear a lot about spending we hear a lot about taxes and uh, oftentimes it's it's hard for um, the voters out there or, because you said we're, we're busy with our mm -hmm. families with our jobs trying to pay our bills trying to save money take care of our property or whatever it is that we oftentimes don't really get down to the nitty-gritty 
numbers. So uh, just to kind of simplify everything, um, first of all, the, the budgeting process. Now, Minnesota State, the state of Minnesota has a two-year uh, budgeting term, is correct. that correct? correct. Um, and uh, can you talk how much uh, is, is spent in those two years? You know, we hear different figures out there, but what is the actual uh, two-year budget? The state of Minnesota, I believe, has 13, maybe 14 funding budgets okay. that they work with. I believe you can look it up online. It's it's all on there. It's really easy to find this information if you go take the time to look it up. What, you, what everybody hears about, the media talks about, the legislators always get up and uproar about is the, the general fund. Okay. And that's basically half of what the state spends. Okay. We so when you read in the paper about the budget, we're billion, about the, the general, general fund. fund budget. Okay. We're not hearing about the other twelve or thirteen other budgets that are in there that the that the state has commitments to manage. Mm -hmm. We talk about the general fund. Mm -hmm. There'll be times when money will be taken out of these other funds, like if there's a shortfall. Instead of raising taxes or cutting spending, hope we do. We might try that. They'll take money out. Of, the state legislature will take money out of these other budgets put it into the general fund until everything gets better and the world turns with pretty flowers, tulips, and <laughs> rainbows, and then they'll take the, the extra money and put it back into those mm -hmm. funds to b pump them back up to where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. A lot of that shenanigans goes back and forth. We all do that. Everybody does that in their own home, too. The only difference between us doing it in our own home and the legislature doing it is they have the power to tax. You don't have the power to walk in and tell your boss to give you a 62% raise. Mm -hmm. The legislature has the power to tax to tax away or, or dump the responsibility of a specific spending on local units of government. They will in turn tax to pay for it, and then the legislature would take those free dollars that they all of a sudden have and spend it on new programs or mm -hmm. spend it on another fund that they want to bump up or you know add to. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what, in general, that's what happens with the money. And so you know, we always hear. Uh, coming year that there's either a, a budget deficit or a budget surplus and so are they just projecting then what the numbers are going to be whether or not there's a shortfall or not because it seemed like this year there there, there, there was excessive taxation and uh, basically they passed too many taxes and took in too much money is that essentially what happened last year they they raised a lot of taxes mm -hmm. the business community got in a big uproar they, the legislature repealed some of those taxes to satisfy the business community. In the overall scope of things, government got bigger across the board. State of Minnesota, I don't care what they say in the, in the news, the fact is if you go look at the numbers, the facts, the, the numbers themselves represent, as an example, the state budget general fund may have been a little squishy, didn't go a whole lot up, but if you look at the other department, the other budgets, those other budgets increased a lot. The overall spending and the whole scope of things actually increased, mm -hmm. which is, again, what, what goes on in St. Paul an awful lot. Mm -hmm. There is a department that forecasts, to I think twice a year they put out a forecast for the legislature to say, here's what the projected revenue is based on our finger, looking at our finger, stick in the air, based on stock market values, the Federal Reserve's de decisions or market value, market expectations. This department collects all this data, puts it into a blender, stirs it up, and comes out with a forecast. Sometimes they do pretty good on that forecast. I've been following this for about 12 years now, this, this process mm -hmm. of budgeting and spending and, and forecasting. It's like saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a raise January 1st. It would be an expectation. What if you don't get the raise? What are you going to do? Well, you're going to cut spending. What government does is they just add more taxes to somebody. Then when they do get the raise, they don't reduce that tax. They just collect more money. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what, we're, what we have, a cycle that never ends. It hasn't ended for 40, 50 years. It's been a consistent cycle of ever larger, ever larger government. So it was recently reported that the unemployment rate in Minnesota just took a, a tick downwards. Um, there were some asterisks there that said that even though the unemployment rate was going down, there's multiple reasons for that, some, some of it being people leaving the workforce. Um, people like Governor Dayton, Al Franken, uh, Amy Klobuchar, they'll say that you know what they did was they inherited a, a terrible uh, economic uh, situation, the financial collapse, and that they've slowly been sh but surely been making the economy better. Specifically in Minnesota, are we in a state of recovery right now? And people in your district, when you go out there, are they feeling more optimistic about the economy? 
The numbers, if you go on the states, there's the data is on the web, on the internet, on the state's website. Mm -hmm. The actual raw numbers of employed people. It's taken 2008 was the low point. 2007 was actually the lowest point in Minnesota where we had a really high unemployment rate. We have actually broke even now with 2008 or 2007 as far as total population that's working. But we have also other factors that are in play that we have a larger population. But we haven't increased the employment based on an increase in population. We're just getting back to where we were in 2008 as far as total population. Mm -hmm. So we had, maybe we added 300,000 people to the state. We have only added 2,000 more jobs since 2008 or 2007 mm -hmm. because our economy is finally recovered. The interest, the unemployment rate is low because people like me retired early. I just gave up in two, two years ago and retired early, seven mm -hmm. years early. Because mm -hmm. in the construction industry, it wasn't going to improve. Now, we do have an improvement in the construction industry now. Most of that is driven in Minnesota by government aid of some sort of another. Mm -hmm. If without that government aid, these investments wouldn't have been made. You can have that argument back and forth all day long. But the fact is they're taking money out of your kids' pocket, not our, not ours necessarily anymore, but future generations of kids' revenue to pay these bills for projects we want to build today to keep people working and feeling happy. Mm -hmm. As I travel the district, I see marked improvements in certain areas. Some of the some of the areas in our city though have a huge vacancy rate. There's another bust that's happening, at least in our area, of people losing their homes mm. because they just can't. Their their jobs, their part-time jobs, aren't making it. Mm -hmm. and they got to decide whether they're going to eat or live in a home, mm -hmm. and they're deciding to go find an apartment someplace, moving with a family member, or whatever else. So we have a large. We have too many empty homes in our neighborhood. Now we're picking up a lot of people from. The inner core of downtown Minneapolis, who are tired of the politics and the and the liberalism of the downtown core, they don't want to go out to Otsego or wherever out outstate Minnesota. They want to stay close to the city. So there's a lot of young couples with no children that are in their late 20s, early 30s that are moving into Columbia Heights and St. Anthony and, and uh, New Brighton, mm -hmm. which is good for us. Problem is they don't know who I am, so I have to work on going out and find and letting them know that I'm out there. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that again. There is a a little bit of an optimism out there as I talk to people, but it's not like rah rah the sun shining and we're all going to have you know tulips in the yard. It's mm -hmm. still not there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people would say uh, Keith Ellison, congressman in in uh, Minneapolis congressional district, he said that regulations are good because regulations create jobs. Governor Dayton said that. Uh, we need to build the Viking Stadium because if we can get the taxpayers to fund it, it'll create jobs in Minnesota and it'll bring more businesses here. Um, there's different definitions. There, there, you know, very strong uh, hard right conservatives will say the way that government can create jobs is to cut all regulations and, and get government out of the economy completely. Where does Tim Oot stand? You know, you're running for the state house. Right. You've got to believe that there's something that you can do or policies that you can promote or policies and laws that you could repeal that would ultimately lead to not only job creation, but the kind of jobs that Minnesotans are, are looking for, which pay good amounts of money and uh, provide good benefits and also security, long-term security. What can a state House representative or what can this, uh, the House of Representatives and the state Senate do uh, to create jobs in your opinion? You talked, yes, yeah, a lot of questions there. <laughs> <laughs> you threw right. I yeah, you that that sometimes. <laughs> I'll take a few, before I forget them, I'll take a few <laughs> of them. I started business in 2005. I got it, just getting it off the ground and the economy collapsed. I lost a couple hundred thousand. It was a, it was a mess, financial mess. One of the things I learned, though, I called the, the state of Minnesota, said, I want to start a business. Would you send me some information? So they sent me out a three-inch book, hey, about that thing, maybe two, and, maybe two and a half inches thick, how to start a business in Minnesota. And I looked at it and I go, you've got to be kidding me. And then, of course, I read through it, and they got to be kidding me. That's what their expectations are. That's not realistic. It, a lot of stuff in there has no business government. Uh, government has no business doing it. I'm a proponent of, again, the state constitution. It clearly defines the limited scope of state government and municipalities and cities and counties, metropolitan council. You go on down a list of organizations that are regulating our lives. You can make, what, you can make the best choice for your families. And you're going to make wrong choices, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also change those choices. Try and change a law. 
I want the laws passed. Go down to St. Paul and try and change it. You can mm -hmm. change your mind in five minutes and go a different direction and make your life better. But if government steps in and or when I should not if when government steps in and starts making arbitrary decisions for the general population, trying to appease a small group or just appease themselves and their power their power grab, you got you have an absolute mess because there's nothing's you're not the same as I am. You got a wife and a little kid and mm -hmm. I got seven kids and a blended family and 13 grandkids. Mm -hmm. But the government still looks at us as the same same unit, the same person as an entity in, in the society. Mm. So are you ready for your uh, next multi-pronged question here? Is, uh, it uh -oh. starts with... Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I saw you taking some notes over there. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, I took a, a trip to uh, Michigan. I had to go there for a uh, friend's, uh, it's actually one of Leona's friend's weddings, so Max and I and You're still doing that, going to weddings? We are. Oh, yep, oh boy. Yep. We went to, uh, we've gotten to about six or seven this summer already, <laughs> with two more still on the way. Uh, but we uh, went to Michigan, drove there, and the first night she had to go to a bachelorette party, and so uh, I drove to Detroit to see uh, one of my good friends from college, Max and I did, and we just hung out in uh, Detroit, Gross Point area. And uh, there's a couple things that really struck me. And um, the first was, as I was driving from Lansing to Detroit, I heard on the radio, it was around the 4th of July time. And they, in Michigan, they recently basically uh, uh, repealed all their fireworks laws and legalized the vast majority of fireworks are now legal in Good Michigan. For them. Good for them. And the other thing that they legalized in, in Michigan was uh, medicinal marijuana. Their laws are pretty much similar to the medicinal marijuana laws that they Colorado. have in California. Okay. Not Colorado. Okay. Colorado is Colorado's the recreational okay. and All right. All right. pretty much opened up, whereas California it still has to have a medical purpose, gotcha. albeit the law is very open as to what that Defines medical. Would, right. like sore thumb or sleeping problems <laughs> or <laughs> whatever. Feeling blue or, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the reason I bring that up is because people have made comparisons of Minnesota to Detroit in terms of if we allow... Uh, these uh, neoliberal legislators to continue their tax and spend policy and kicking businesses out, that eventually the well is going to dry up and uh, we're going to end up in a bankruptcy situation or something similar. And that's what happened in Detroit. And now they're picking themselves up by the bootstraps. They've gotten some new leadership in there. And I found it interesting that they're legalizing the fireworks, the medicinal marijuana, and there's multiple justifications and reasons for that, which um, twofold question, are we in danger of becoming Detroit? And secondly, what are your, uh, what's your viewpoint on medicinal marijuana? I'll get the second one first. I'm all for that. Now, your first question was, as far as, I've asked that question again. Are we going to become Detroit? Yeah. I actually believe we already are in a sense is, personally, if you got to borrow money, they make to make ends meet. There's a problem, something with something wrong with your book, checkbook, your balancing book. Minnesota has a very at large appetite for credit. Mm -hmm. It spends a lot of money. It borrows a lot of money. It like it likes credit. We individuals like credit far too much, and that's what hurt us in 08. A lot of people in 08 they had overextended themselves. The government again overextended itself, but then it took instead of cutting its spending, it took it out of you and me. Mm -hmm. And they never gave us that, the, the expenses that they took out of us, they never repealed those expenses. They just add them on to the next, the mm -hmm. next, by, so yeah, so that's where I'm standing on that. I, uh, well, it's interesting, you know, in the, in the times, it, you know, if you look at the traditional history of Keynesian economics, of the spending economics, you know, you go back to the days of FDR and, and deficit spending, and true Keynesianism isn't what is being purported today. Right. It used to be that, you'd build up surplus and reserves and in time of crisis, times of crisis, that's when you take those reserves, which are savings, mm -hmm. and you infuse it into the economy and basically create a, a temporary band-aid until the rest of the private sector can keep up. Current Keynesianism states something more along the lines of what you're saying. Uh, print the money, borrow the money, 
do whatever you can to fill in that deficit and to keep spending it and spending it and spending it. And there's no talk whatsoever of creating a reserve system at all. Or any self-control. And, you know, what it, what is the end result uh, going to be? I mean, are you worried, um, you know, for your family 10, 20 years down the line? Or do you think that we're going to have to pay, have our day of reckoning come before that? Or are do you think we can guide ourselves through this and, and make it make it better? You have to change your behavior and what you're doing. Or you're going to repeat it. You know, that those are just basics of life. The state of Minnesota government hasn't learned its lesson. The the people have, and they're still trying to recover from it. But the government hasn't learned its lessons. I then this is back to mixing politics and religion. Hmm. I love doing this. <laughs> In our Bible, we're told the borrower is always a servant to the lender. No, the lender is the bar, Yeah, the borrower yeah. is always servant to the lender. That's a great principle. We had to really take heart and really take seriously looking at that and, and sit down and chew on that for a while. If I borrow 100 bucks from you, one, I got emotional attachment to you. I don't like owing you money every time I see you. I'm going to annoy you over that money. Even if I'm making payments to yep. it, I, there's always there's a, that, resentment. There's a, there's a <laughs> resentment there. And you're always looking to show, is Tim going to make that payment next week because I just already got laid yep. off or is, or is he's having a kid or whatever. Yep. Or if he stopped making that payment, then I said, what, what are you buying that to? What are you buying? A, what are you, do what you really need to buy for McDonald's? <laughs> yeah, right. Do you really need that? You're a little chunky already, Tim. So what are you going to McDonald's for and you owe me 50 bucks? It's one thing to give somebody money and say, here it is, here's 100 bucks. I don't want to hear about it again. Mm -hmm. or, and I, I, what I've done and my wife has done over the years, we'll find somebody in need, we'll anonymously put an envelope and mail it to them with no way they can trace it back, usually cash or whatever. We'll drop it off at their house in the middle of the night and they get it the next day. We'll hear about it months later. Oh, man, I woke up and there's a $100 bill or a, or a cup food card or, or mm -hmm. credit debit card for cup mm -hmm. food or whatever. Those are principles that we've lost. We don't we don't know them ourselves anymore. We don't practice them. We don't teach our kids those things, those values of self-control and discipline, financial responsibility, don't borrow money. I, I'm not saying you never borrow money, but you've got to understand if you're borrowing money, you're now duty-bound and object and subservient to that person or that entity, whether it's a bank or your best friend or your or your mo or your mother-in-law. You don't want to definitely go those, go those routes unless there's a specific reason for it. On the other side, the other person should be saying, you know what, if you're really in trouble, here's $500 or whatever. And it, sure, it may hurt me, but in the long run, if I give that to you, we don't have this issue between us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about the bullying law? That was something that was passed oh, in the I recent just, uh, recent session. And I've watched a, a lot of the debate on the bullying law. And, you know, you'd hear time and time again the uh, Democrat or the person in favor of it would say, we need to trust our local school districts, but on the other side, we need to jam this bill down to tell the local school districts what to do and exactly how to do it. Um, do you, would you have supported the anti-bullying law? If no, you were? absolutely Why not. not. Because it specifically targets a certain segment of our, of our communities, it, just, it, it creates special interest groups. It creates a state-level bureaucracy of unelected, unaccountable people who are appointed to play czar over the whole issue. I've actually read the bill. I challenge anybody who takes issue with me, you go on the, state secretary, or the state's website, you look the bill up yourself, and you read it line by line by line by line. And sit there and just absorb and think about the the um, auxiliary consequences, the, the collateral damage that's going to be caused. It is so vague that this board is, a, is allowed to establish these arbitrary... And it, technically, if you look at it, you, it, our conversation right now, if you found it offensive, I'm bullying you. Mm -hmm. Well, there's but also the, the, one of the criticisms of it as well was that there's the, there's the chance that reverse bullying could take place. You can get two or three students that want to um, uh, go after one student, and they can anonymously accuse that one student of bullying and not have to uh, really, you know, they don't have to testify or they don't have to do anything. And aren't they actually bullying that student? Is there, yeah, is there a risk? And again, it's government making a decision, and they don't understand the, the collateral damage that's caused by this. Another part of the bill is anybody who works in education or connected to education at all, bus driver, mechanic, whatever, if they see if they see anything that's defined in these laws, they have to report it or they become part of the problem. Mm. There is no, I can't make an arbitrary decision that Mary's, pick, you know, Mary's kick Steve's sand in Steve's face because she's mad at him. 
Well, I have to report that as a bullying. It pro and this doesn't go away. If you're a six-year-old and you get in a fight, what six-year-olds don't fight? I, I grew mm -hmm. up with my three sisters, and we always got along real well and fought and whatever mm -hmm. else. That stays with you throughout your educational experience. And, and it, there's plans and college, pushing, college the, pushing the college record, pushing it, actually carrying us into all through colleges. Mm. There's a push now to expand the K-12 to the college level, this whole issue of this uh, bullying. Mm. And again, what are the parents, where are the parents at? That's our job. My job is to make John, so Johnny doesn't spit on Mary or Mary doesn't kick sand in Stevie's face. That's our mm -hmm. responsibility. Between us as parents, we don't need the Board of Education to, play, to, again, play tyrant and start dictating what we can and can't do or what we can and can't think. Well, I think that was another uh, criticism of this is that there's actual, it's actually written into the statute, the anti-bullying law, that says that parents don't have to be told that no. their kids are being accused of bullying, that they can actually be left out of the, the out picture of process. completely. Right. And you can get the psychiatric community. There's all kinds of auxiliary uh, police, law enforcement, the judiciary. I mean, you, you, it just turns into a big can of worms mm. that, that we should never even consider passing. Well, Tim, we're coming, uh, we're coming to the, towards uh, the ending part of our show, but I just wanted to, like, get your information out there. I certainly appreciate uh, you coming into the studio. Um, what sort of, uh, do you have any like events that are coming up or, or We got anything? actually St. Anthony Parade this coming Friday. What are we on, Saturday night? Yeah, it's coming Friday, St. Okay. Anthony Parade. Anybody who wants to come, if you like what you hear today and you're really interested and you want to walk in a parade, we encourage you to come. Afterwards, we're meeting at our house at the White House. You saw in a snowbank, but it's actually you know, 85 right now. But go there. Afterwards, we're going to feed everybody. The lake will be available for people to swim. We just did Columbia Heights a few weeks ago. We had an absolute blast of a lot of people showed up. We, so if anybody's interested, encouraged, you live in our district, or you don't even live in our district, and you want to walk in a parade, you're welcome to come. So the St. Saint, Saint Anthony Parade, that's coming up. Uh, this Friday, August 1st, and then the following Thursday is New Brighton's Parade. So we have St. Anthony, Columbia Heights, New Brighton. So we still got the two more parades. we got a full, the next two weeks, Mike, I am just full of political activity. We have parades, we have 49er days, no, the stockyard days. There's just all kinds of stuff going on in our district in the next couple of weeks. But the... We really want to have some fun walking at parades. So this is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. That's and one thing we got going on. Then that National Night Out is coming up. We're going to be running around. When is National Night Out? Uh, August 5th. Okay. Between the two parades. Coming up. We have, uh, what are you going about to be doing We have about 300 locations we're trying to hit. Uh, that that doesn't happen, but we try. Mm -hmm. We try. It's good to, good to say. Detroit has 154 uh, locations of their own on uh, just, just little black just parties, the, street yeah. parties, park yep. parties. I can get to about 30, and that's been my record was 30, but I was at 9 30 night swatting mosquitoes trying to do it. But night, and there's still people out at 9 30 at night. Mm -hmm. So we get about 25, is about our about normal. Uh, we, well, we're setting up teams of two to just actually go out in different parts of the, of the district to represent me. Stop this! Hey, Tim's you know, thinking of you, but he can't make it because he's over here or something mm -hmm. else. So. Well, I'm uh, looking yeah. on your website, uh, Tim Oots for House, and com, looks yeah. like you know he's he, Tim, Tim Oots for yep. House dot com. A lot of fun nice things on there. Yep, yeah, we just got the Libertarian Apartment Libertarian Party endorsement this week, which I didn't post up there yet. We have uh, six years of photo photos and whatnot on there from the last six years of parades and what all kinds of political uh, community events I participate in. We got. Just a lot of stuff on the website. Yeah, there. looks we like you got a lot Facebook. nice list of people. And, I'm and trying to learn Twitter for the under 35 crowd, but that's really tough to do Twitter, but I'm trying. Hey, you know, if you don't tweet, it can it, keep yourself out yeah, of trouble. Yeah, too. that's Many people get in trouble with Twitter tweeting, these days. Yeah. So that's what I got going on. A lot of activities. It's just it's going to get worse and worse and worse all the way up through election day. Well, Tim Oots, thank you so much. Thank you for, for your time. Uh, Appreciate it. It was a lot Appreciate of fun. It. Hope you can come back again in yes. the future. Yes. When I'm elected in November, we'll come back and have a great conversation. Sounds good to me. That's Tim Oots, candidate for the Minnesota State House of Representatives in District 41B. Go to his website, timootsforhouse.com. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Reminder, we broadcast every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios. Thank you.